So welcome to my talk, Just Add Data, Making It Easier to Prioritize Your Documentation. My name is Sarah Moyer. As Nick said, I've been a technical writer since 2013. And I have been working at Splunk since 2015. And Splunk is a big data analysis software company. But this talk is not about Splunk. I just really love analyzing data, as well as rock climbing and music. So feel free to come up and talk to me about those things as well after my talk. Prioritizing documentation is hard. How do you decide what to work on if there's not a looming deadline? And how do you decide what not to work on when your backlog just keeps growing? How do you identify what new stuff you might want to add to the documentation? Well, by adding data to that process, it's possible to do all of this with confidence. This is a simplified backlog of mine. It's a list of work that I need to complete. And this work is in addition to the work that I have associated with a specific release. So it's much harder to prioritize. I need to add documentation for old API endpoints, add an example for creating a dashboard, unrelated to a release. So what did I do? How did I decide to prioritize that list of work? I'll typically ask myself some questions, like what will take the least amount of time? Or what did someone most recently request of me? I might talk to my product manager or do just what seems easiest at the time. I might even just do whatever I can get done without talking to other people, because it's early in the morning and I'm tired. <laughs> Based on those questions, I'll come up with a prioritized backlog, but I lack confidence that what I'm working on is really useful, and that what I've chosen to work on will actually bring the most value to customers and the documentation. Especially if I'm choosing not to do work, it can be a challenge to keep ignoring an item on the backlog just because it doesn't fit with what I think I need to be working on. And especially if I don't have any sort of proof that it's OK to ignore, it can be tough. So to make this process easier, I add data to it. Using data to prioritize a documentation backlog can help give you more confidence in your decisions and help you justify that why, you're work why you're not working on something. It can challenge your assumptions about what you should be working on or validate them. And it can help improve your overall understanding of how customers are using both your product and the documentation, which can lead to benefits beyond just your backlog. So this talk will cover a bunch of different things. We've got data types that I'll talk you through available to you, questions that you can use to help you analyze things, collecting your data, analyzing and interpreting it, and then we'll talk through a specific example from the backlog. So when I'm talking about data, what kinds of data am I talking about? We've got all kinds of data available to us. If you skim this list, you'll notice that this goes beyond just quantitative sources. This isn't just a metrics talk. I'm including all kinds of information when I talk about data. Qualitative comments, usage metrics, metadata, forum questions, website access logs. All of these and more fit in with my definition of data. Some of these data types are more relevant to different types of organizations and documentation installations. If you're open source, you might have much more useful issue tags. Or if you use DITA, you'll have easier access to topic types. So I want to talk about a couple of these data types in more detail. Usage data for the products, also called telemetry data, can help you find out where people are spending their time. What features or functionality are they using? And even if they've purchased or installed the product, are they actually using it? If your product is only in beta, for example, and you want more data to help you prioritize an entire overall documentation backlog, topics tied to a specific release included, you can use some product usage data to understand where people are spending more of their time and draw conclusions about what to prioritize. Site metrics, like page views, session data, referrer data, we're all fairly familiar with these data types. These can help you understand where people are coming to your docs from, how long they're staying on various pages, how many readers you have, and where they're going after they get to a topic. You can also use this data to better understand how people interact with your documentation, whether they're using a version switcher on your page or expanding or collapsing more information. You can even split this data by IP address to understand groups of topics that specific users are clustering around to better understand how people use the documentation. 
So this list is to demonstrate the different types of information that can help you prioritize documentation. But I don't want you to think that you need to do a large scale collection or implementation to get any valuable data worth incorporating into your prioritization process. This is about making do with what you have to answer what you want to know. But what do you want to know? That depends on what your backlog is. Let's go back to mine to get an idea of what I want to know to help me prioritize this backlog. I had to go through each item on this list and identify some questions that I want to answer for each of the items and then use those questions to identify which types of data I need to use. So for each of these backlog items, what questions can help me understand them better? For adding documentation for old API endpoints, I can ask, what are people looking for and not finding? And are those API endpoints part of that? For adding an example for creating a dashboard, what use cases are not represented for our customers? And what might customers be trying to do what markets or areas are those customers a part of? To make a doc topic more user-centric, I might want to know what are people looking for and not finding? And is the content missing, or can they just not find it? For adding detail about configuration settings, I might want to know what our customers want more help with, and are they asking for information about these configuration settings that the docs don't have? So after you define these questions, you can tie them to specific data types. So for what are customers looking for and not finding, specific data types that you can look at might include search keyword data, common forum questions, and support case topics. If I can see search, search terms that people are using on the documentation site that don't return results, I can identify cases where people are looking for information but literally not finding it in the documentation. For what do our customers want more help with, you can look at support case topics, unanswered questions, and even the enrollment on various training courses. For customer groups that we're targeting that don't see their use cases represented, you can identify sales leads, field questions being asked by your sales representatives, and training courses to help find questions that are being asked in those training courses to help identify additional data types. You can also start with the data that's available to you and see what you can learn from it, especially if you want to be adding things to your to-do list. Maybe you're not able to identify a bunch of questions. Maybe you don't really have that extensive of a backlog. So you're really just working with the data that you have. You can identify interest in content that maybe you weren't aware of and make some plans to write more to address that interest. Or you can modify some existing content to address that interest. Maybe there's a bunch of forum threads about how to do something, but there's nothing authoritative in the documentation. That information hasn't made it to the documentation writers, but because you're looking at the available data, you're able to see that it's important to your customers. And even if you don't have any data specifically relevant to the documentation or customer questions, you can create your own data and identify documentation work to add to a to-do list. So you can create data by performing text analysis on all or specific documentation topics, identify complexity issues or topics that don't adhere to a style guide using a style linter like we've been hearing about yesterday. You can use customer satisfaction surveys to identify places where documentation architecture or your linking strategies could use some work. So now you have a better understanding of the different di data types available to you and how you can identify these valuable data sources based on your questions for analysis. But how much data do you need to use? And how do you even get that data? And how do you analyze it and interpret it to actually do something with it? How much data do you need? You don't need all the data. You just need a little bit of data. You need enough data to point you in a direction. The point of data collection is to reduce uncertainty. You can use a small sample of users, a small sample of time. As long as it helps you answer your question and reduce uncertainty about what that answer might be, Collecting larger amounts of data doesn't mean that you reduce, reduce uncertainty by an equally large degree. The amount of data that you collect doesn't correlate directly to what you're able to learn from it. If the question you're trying to answer with data concerns all the documentation users over a super long period of time, you'll be collecting more data than if you just want to know what a specific subset of readers found interesting last Friday. 
So you want to try for representative samples that are relevant for the questions you're trying to answer. And if you can't get representative data, then try for a random sample of data. If you can't get either of those, well, you can acknowledge the bias that's inherent in the data that you're using and keep the context close to the data, like who it represents and why it's still valuable if it's, rep if it's not representative. And you might find that collecting a small amount of data just leads you with more questions and answers, and that's OK, too. But how do you get this data? By and large, you'll either be collecting your own data or asking others for it. If it's data about the documentation site or its content, you probably own that yourself and already have access to it. And if it's other types of data, like sales leads or user research data, it's time to make some friends, talk to the departments or people that manage those areas. A business development department might have reporting on internal tools like sales leads or support cases. Product managers can share direct customer data and product usage data if you don't already have access to it. And project managers can share data related to internal development processes. So the teams managing different data sets will vary at your organization and might even be you in many cases. Other teams might be reluctant to share data with you. So with that in mind, remember that when you collect data, you don't need persistent access to it. Just focus on getting some access to some data that can help you answer your questions and make your work more efficient and informed. And once you're able to prove that, you can communicate that value and get more access to these data types in the future if you want it. So what do you use to analyze that data after you get it? You've finally gotten data. How do you interpret it? What do you do with it? How do you make it a report of useful information? Some tools might already have analytics and reporting built in, like Google Analytics, or we were talking about Zendesk in an unconference yesterday. That certainly makes it easier to analyze the data. But if you aren't able to use a pre-existing reporting tool and you need to analyze these data types yourself, really you want to use the tools available to you. So if you know how to use Excel, great. You're going to have a spreadsheet party start collecting and processing in those spreadsheets. If you know how to write scripts in R or Python, you're a developer, you've got familiarity with the data processing language, you can start collecting, processing, and visualizing data with those. And if your organization uses a tool like Splunk or Elasticsearch or Tableau, then you're really ready for data analysis. But you really don't have to spend a long time learning new tools to get started doing data analysis. If you start using this all the time, it might make sense. But it's not necessary just to get started incorporating data analysis into your work. Tools are not magic. Some degree of data analysis will always involve manual collecting, categorizing, or cleaning the data. If your organization doesn't have strict topic types, for example, you might need to perform that manually if you want to use that data. If you want to analyze some information, but the data is not in a machine-readable format, maybe you just have a PDF, you might have to sit at your desk copy-pasting for hours. Depending on your skills and the current state of the data that you want to analyze, the tools available to you, the amount of time it takes can vary widely. I've spent anywhere from three days manually processing data in Excel and just two hours dealing with already cleaned up data sets in Splunk searching them. So keep that in mind when you want to start doing data analysis. So when you analyze data, what are you actually looking at? What are you doing? The most easiest place to start is going to be with top, rare, and outlying values, looking at what values are most common, which values are least common. So these can be established by just counting the various instances of values in your data. You can also look for values that are different from others by a large margin, using standard deviation to identify outliers. You can also look for patterns and clusters in your data. If you're working with qualitative data, you might need to categorize or code the data that you're looking at so that you can sort it and look for patterns. You can identify these patterns by counting instances of categories, looking at clusters of behavior. Like what, if you look at a documentation topic and the page views over time, you can maybe identify a spike at a particular time. There's a cluster of behavior. 
You also want to be able to segment your data by different features. So you can better understand the most common values if you split them by other types of information. So if you're looking at the most commonly visited topics in your documentation set in the last three months, you can look at that and see, OK, what were the most commonly visited topics in the last three months? That's not going to be as valuable as if you split those three months by week and you look at those on a week to week basis. So then you can understand how those values are changing over time when you're looking at them on a week to week basis. If you see a spike in a particular topic or category of topics, you can then interpret that data. So maybe a new product release led to a spike of interest in your release notes topic. That wasn't easily identified until you split the re results by week because it wasn't enough to rise up to the top of a, a three month long amount of data. Seeing these types of spikes is also a great opportunity to point out that your documentation is actually read by the customers. People do look at it when a release happens. So that's an example of splitting data by time. But you can also split it by other types of data available to you. So you could split the most common topics by product and identify if different products have different popular topics, or by IP address to see what specific users are looking at, or by other factors available to you to identify some valuable insights. You can also combine different data types to understand approximately how many people are using the product versus how many of them are using the documentation, for example. You can compare sales leads, product usage data, and page views to help you approximate the number of potential existing customers of your product alongside the number of distinct documentation readers. But make sure that when you're combining data across data sets, you keep track of units and time ranges to make sure that you're comparing like data with like data. So be careful not to use data that refers to potential customers alongside data that refers to existing customers because that might lead to misleading results. So when you're interpreting the results of your data analysis, you want to make sure that you're adding context to the data. So especially when you're dealing with outlier data, but even when you're reviewing rarely viewed or frequently viewed topics, keep in mind additional context that could explain the results. Most importantly, use your expertise and knowledge of the documentation to add context. Adding data to this process isn't about replacing you with data. It's about enhancing the data with you and your expertise. Topics concerning specific functionality are more likely to be popular at a specific time if that functionality was recently changed. Only you know that, and you can add that context. Whenever you're interpreting the data, you want to make sure that you're gut checking it against what you already know. So if a relatively mundane topic has wildly out of the ordinary page views, there's likely alternate explanations for that. So maybe your topic just ended up being an excellent resource on cron syntax in general, even for people that don't use your product. You also want to be cautious when you're aggregating your data. So if you're aggregating data, say with an average, you want to make sure that you fully understand what that aggregate represents so that you can accurately interpret it. It might be useful to know that the average rating customers give your documentation is three stars. But you won't fully understand those three stars until you look at the data behind the average. So if you have a three star rating because customers are consistently rating your documentation three out of five stars, that might mean you want to improve your overall documentation quality. But if you have a three star rating because customers are rating it either five stars or one star consistently, maybe you have a style issue or maybe you have an audience targeting issue and it's super helpful for some customers and super not helpful for others. Either way, you can't rely on aggregate values to tell you everything you might need to know in order to interpret this data accurately. You want to draw realistic conclusions based on the data available to you. You might not be able to get access to or combine specific data sets due to privacy concerns. But if you carefully identify what problems you're trying to solve, select only the data sources that can help you solve those problems, you can reduce the potential that you'll introduce bias into your data analysis. And that can improve the conclusions that you're able to draw. Most importantly, if you take nothing else home with you, don't trust data blindly. When reviewing data that seems out of the ordinary or outliers, examine the different reasons why the data could be like that. Who does the data represent, and what does it represent? 
making sure that you're interpreting that data in context so that you're able to understand exactly what it represents. It can be tempting to ignore data that doesn't match your biases or expectations. But remember to use data to complement your research and writing. It's validating or challenging assumptions about your audience. It doesn't stand alone. This is everything we've covered so far. We've made it. We've talked about data types, questions for analysis. But let's talk through a specific example. What does this actually look like when you put it into practice? So again, back to my backlog. These are all the items that need my attention. But let's talk about how I would use data analysis to learn more about how to prioritize these old API endpoints. I have this backlog item about adding documentation for old API endpoints, services disable and services enable endpoints. An internal engineer noticed that they were missing. But the endpoints have been undocumented for a while. Talked to some colleagues, discovered that they just missed them. It wasn't an intentional decision. They just forgot about them, or never knew about them, more likely. So I want to understand more about the customer needs so that I can prioritize this work alongside my other work. The question I'm trying to answer is, what are people looking for and not finding? And are these endpoints part of it? So in this case, this question is, are people looking for these endpoints? I need to identify the data sources I can use to answer this question. And how do I find those? Well, where are people looking for information? They're looking at the user community. So check some forum data that you have access to. This can be internal and external forums. We have an internal forum at Splunk, but Stack Overflow and Reddit count just as well. They'll also ask search engines. So anywhere you might have search keyword data can be useful to look. They'll also ask for help from support. Sometimes people talk to people. So you can use support case data. And these are three potential data sources that you can use to collect this information. So after you've collected that data, what do you look for in those data sets? You're not just looking at the exact name of the API endpoint you want to find, but also some variations, like API endpoints info, just services endpoint info, how to enable or disable services, and the specific endpoints as well. Interpreting the data can be more straightforward. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're able to view. <coughs> See if I get my voice back, maybe. <clears throat> I have some water, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is what happens when you go to the party on Tuesday night and you talk in a bar. <clears throat> Pardon me. OK, it's back. All right. So interpreting this data can get more straightforward if you're able to view. Thank you. Now I have two. If you're able to view the actual search strings or the forum toast post titles, people are literally typing out their questions. So it's a little bit easier to interpret. You want to make sure that you're gut checking the strings that you review in terms of verifying that people, oh, I went back, in terms of verifying that people are actually looking for information about API endpoints and not just how to enable or disable services from the UI, for example. That's where your product expertise and your documentation set expertise can come in to help you interpret the results. So now I've collected and analyzed the data for the old API endpoints. And I've done that for all these other backlog items in secret, because this talk is only 30 minutes long. I'm ready to prioritize my work now using data. I was able to reduce my uncertainty about my pre-existing prioritization process as a result. So let's see where that got me. All right. This is my prioritized blog now that I've added data. In reviewing this data, there were lots of questions about how to do something that's documented. But clearly, people were not finding that information. It's content I already knew could be more user-centric. It was already on my backlog. And there were a large volume of questions that could be answered by that topic. So I chose to do this first. My analysis also led me to see that people were posting about the API endpoints that were undocumented in the forums. They were also searching on the developer documentation site about how to call the endpoints. So I knew there was interest in that specific information, so I chose to prioritize that second. Based on the data available to me, I couldn't sufficiently answer which use cases were not represented for customers. 
So I looked at sales lead data. I looked at data from my product management team. And I discovered the products being sold to customers in the financial services industry. But I don't know if those customers actually are going to be creating dashboards or what sort of dashboards they might be creating if they were. I'm also able to determine that it's not worth it yet to add detail about configuration settings. So I've left that at the bottom of my prioritization list. This also gives me the opportunity where if someone asks me why I chose not to work on this, I actually have something to tell them. I have specific data analysis that I can point to that says, here's why I'm not doing your pet project and why I'm not documenting this thing in hyper detail. It's because customers are not looking for it. I can share this data or insights with them. And if I screwed up, if I missed something or misinterpreted the data I had access to, then they can share additional data or insights to let me know why I'm wrong. Or then they'll realize I put in a lot of work to understanding the customers and their problem, and they'll trust my judgment even better. So now it's your turn. You can add data to your prioritization process by following these simple steps. Start by identifying the questions that you're trying to answer based on your to-do list. Then you can use the data and tools available to you to analyze and interpret that data and prioritize your own task list. Now I'll let you all take photos. <laughs> Pause for the camera. <laughs> so some additional resources available to you. You can reach out to me on Twitter. I've had my handle at the bottom of all of these slides. Uh, I'll be publishing a blog post two blog posts that talk more about the data types in detail, uh, as well as a summary of this talk. Those will be linked on Twitter as well. The Product is Docs book is a book that Splunk wrote. It's not a plug, because we donate all of the royalties to charity. There's a chapter in there on measuring success. The How to Measure Anything book by Doug Hubbard is where I stole this concept of reducing uncertainty as being the primary cause of uh, doing data analysis. And Bob Watson also has some helpful posts on docsbydesign.com about measuring value. And Erica Hall has a book called Just Enough Research that's all about how to know when to stop doing research and collecting data. I'll also be doing an unconference this afternoon right after lunch if you want to talk about data analysis for documentation. Thank you.